Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar by the Global Antibiotic Research and Development Partnership, GARDP. My name is Victor Kwasi, and I'll be hosting today's session on animal models to study the activity of antibiotics. Revive is GARDP's education and outreach program. It aims to connect and support the antimicrobial R&D community by facilitating learning, sharing knowledge, and connecting people. These webinars are part of our educational activities. All webinars are recorded and freely available to view after the live broadcast on our website, revive.garp.org slash webinars. As well as this, you can also read our series of articles known as Antimicrobial Viewpoints, where experts discuss various topics within the field. You can also have a look at our resources section, which includes the Antimicrobial Encyclopedia. This has definitions on various terms in the field and also includes videos where experts give further explanations on the terms. As always, today's presentations will be followed by a Q&A session. You can submit your questions at any time during the webinar via the questions slide, um, via the questions window shown in this slide. We will address many, as many questions after the presentations as possible. Um, so please do um, submit. Today's speakers are Lynn Measel and Jennifer Herman. Our moderator today is William Hope. William is the director of the Center of Excellence in Infectious Diseases Research at the University of Liverpool. Welcome, William. I now hand over to you to introduce our speakers for today. Thank you, Victor. Hello, everybody. Um, I hope that you're keeping uh, nice and cool wherever you are in the world. Um, You'll excuse me if I keep my camera off today because I've just had a little surgery and I'm not looking too too good. Um, but um, I'm very happy to be here to uh, chair today and hopefully have a wonderful discussion about laboratory animal models for antimicrobial drug development. Um, so our first speaker today is Lynn uh, Meisel. Uh, Lynn is a senior technical director of in vivo pharmacology at um, Pharmacology Discovery Services. Lynn has extensive industry experience and is working on many compounds that are currently in development pipelines. Um, and I've worked with Lynn and I know she has fantastic expertise and knowledge. And Lynn is going to talk about murine models for antimicrobial drug development for the next 25 minutes. Lynn, over to you. Thank you, William, for the introduction. And also thank you, Victor, for inviting me to speak. And thank you all in the audience for your attendance. So I'm Lynn Miesel, the Senior Technical Director representing Pharmacology Discovery Services. And we're a contract research organization that conducts preclinical testing of pharmacokinetics, tolerability, and efficacy using rodent models, including models for antibiotic efficacy analysis. And I'm going to talk about mouse models commonly used to study the um, activity of antibiotics. And so let's make sure I can use my pointer and advance the slides. One minute, please. So I don't appear to have control of my, ah, here we go. Happiness. There we go. And do you see my pointer now? Yes, Lee. Yes. There we go. Okay, so the objective today is that I'm gonna, I'm gonna be covering how we establish mouse infection models, and then how do we use them to characterize novel antibacterial discovery compounds um, that are used or will be used to treat priority antimicrobial resistant infections. And so I'm gonna be focusing on lung and thigh infection models with neutropenic mice, and then lung and septicemia infection models with immunocompetent mice, and these types of models are used to evaluate world uh, model to generate models with World Health Organization priority gram-negative and positive pathogens, 
and they're commonly used to, for antimicrobial drug discovery testing. And we have a number of models that aren't included, I won't talk about today, including urinary tract, wound, dermal, and vaginal gonorrhea models. Um, but they are conceptually similar. And so I think um, this will give you a good insight on how the models are developed and how they're used for efficacy. So let's go to the next slide. So before starting out, I just wanna make a point about animal welfare since we're talking about animal studies. And I wanna uh, point out that all of the work that we discuss here and all the models are performed in accordance with the guide for care and use of laboratory animals by the National Research Council. And it's conducted with the oversight of our veterinarians in our ALAC accredited vivarium um, to assure the humane treatment of animals. Okay, so before I start on the discussion of animal efficacy studies, there are some work that you must conduct before evaluating your therapeutic candidate. Um, and that is, includes evaluating the efficacy in vitro in the minimum inhibitory concentration assay or some form of act assay to assure that your compound is active in vitro. And you want to know that serum does not interfere with that activity. A soluble formulation is highly, highly, highly recommended for discovery testing. And it's best to know the pharmacokinetics and the tolerability range of your compound to know the frequency so that we can assess or figure out the frequency of dosing and the, the maximum dose amount so that you can have the best evaluation of your compound or test article. And this topic has been discussed in fairly good detail in a prior workshop conducted by NIAD on June 23rd, and you can access this, um, and I presented on that, so I'm not gonna cover it again here. All right, so I'm focusing on mice, but there's, a, of course, other animal species that can be used to evaluate an antimicrobial agent. And, and the reason I'm talking about mice is, is that they are, they are most commonly used for early discovery testing because they're reliable, and relevant mammalian species that's commonly used for testing tolerability, pharmacokinetics, and efficacy. And there's established models that are widely used across the industry, and there's published data available uh, for most approved drugs using these models, in particular the thigh and lung models. And most importantly, the exposure response relationship established in mouse in the thigh and lung models translates to efficacy in humans. So these are really important models throughout discovery and development. So I'm gonna first talk about the thigh and lung models. And these are conducted with neutropenic mice. So they're rendered neutropenic with cyclophosphamide. And that in act, the cyclophosphamide, the neutropenia eliminates the activity of the host immune system so that the pathogen can grow quite well. And the antimicrobial effect that's observed in the models are due to the test article's activity. So the cyclophosphamide is administered at 150 milligrams per kilogram day four prior to infection, and then again at 100 milligrams per kilogram day one prior to infection, and then animals are infected on day zero either by intranasal or by intramuscular injection. And then test article is then dose is initiated starting at two hours after infection, most commonly. And then at other test dose times, depending on the test article, the half-life, et cetera. Um, anim, there's two animal types of animal groups. There's one control group that is sacrificed at two hours after infection for the baseline counts, and you're gonna hear about the baseline counts a lot. And then for the endpoints to look at the treatment effect, animals are sacrificed at 26 hours after infection. The tissues are harvested and bacteria are enumerated with the dilution method. Okay, the animals most typically are female. Again, they're neutropenic. And most commonly, I see our mice six to eight weeks old. We use six week old mice. All right. 
So this is an ex example of how we establish these infection models. And this is con uh, conducted with an example strain, Klebsiella pneumoniae. This is a, um, a this strain is AR Bank 0160. It's carbapenem resistant due to the presence of an OXA48 enzyme. And the first step to, not, to generating a reproducible model is to determine the inoculum titration. And um, so the, in, the pathogen suspension is serially diluted to test at a dilution range. In this case, 10 to the 7th, 10 to the 6th, and 10 to the 5th CFU per mouse. And we have two time points, two hours, corresponding to that, that two-hour baseline count, and then 26 hours. And we measure the bacterial counts with dilution plating. And we do this for the three different inoculum titers. And what we're looking for is a baseline count of approximately 10 to the 6 CFU per lung in the lung model, and about a, at least a one log, two log, or two log increase in counts, preferably two log, um, for 10 to the 8th CFU per lung at the 26 hour time point. So in this particular model, this 10 to the 6th inoculum worked quite nicely. And we saw the same phenomenon with the thigh infection model. That is, a, um, the, the bacterial counts are a function of the inoculum um, implanted in the animal. And the 10 to the 6th inoculum worked quite well. So the second step in establishing the model is to evaluate a standard of care antibiotic to use as a control, and then also assure that the model yields dose responsive effect. And so this, and this shows you an evaluation of levofloxacin, and it also shows you the type of data that we can recover from these models. On the vertical axis is your bacterial counts, and then on the horizontal axis is, is your dose group, going from low to high, um, and there's the baseline count control group, 10 to the 6 CFU per mouse um, as the baseline counts, and the vehicle group, um, bacterial counts increase by two logs. And we see a very nice dose responsive reduction in counts by levofloxacin in both the lung and the thigh models. And one of the points that I wanted to make is what do you consider a significant effect? Well, significance is evaluated using ANOVA to, um, to compare to the baseline counts, because what we're looking for is an antibacterial effect reducing the counts relative to the, the start at the dose period you could consider this slight reduction in counts relative to the vehicle to be a reduction. And yes, it is. It's some, some form of antibacterial effect. But it's really not a reduction relative to the initial counts. So sometimes, sometimes investigators get really enthusiastic when they see a small reduction relative to the vehicle. It's really the, the uh, reduction relative to the baseline that we're looking for here. And we can do nonlinear regression of this dose response data to, gener to generate values for baseline and one and two log 10 reductions in counts relative to the baseline, and then an ED50 value. And this is the values are shown here for the lung and the thigh model as an example. And one of the points I wanted you to see here is that the efficacy of the same drug against the same pathogen may differ between the lung and the thigh model. It's going to depend on the test article. How well does it reach the pathogen? So in the case of the lung model, the drug must reach the epithelial lining fluid of the lung. And in the case levofloxacin, has high exposure to the epithelial lining fluid, and thus it has very nice potency in the lung model and slightly more potent than in the thigh model. So the static dose is lower in the lung model, as well as the, the doses required to see a one or two log 10 kill. And sometimes we see that with um, 
with investigators test articles as well. So as a, in drug discovery, it sometimes can be useful to test a couple different models. So here's an example of an investigator's com, um, compound. This is, the, this is um, Dale Boger from, the, from Scripps University. And it's a value, an evaluation of vancomycin derivatives in a thigh infection model with vancomycin resistant MRSA, this is the VANA producing strain, and it's completely resistant to vancomycin in vitro with an MIC of greater than 64 micrograms per mil. And in this study, the investigator evaluated their test article at a, with a single dose administration um, administered two hours after infection. The controls in the study were linazolid because vancomycin is not very active against the vancomycin resistant strain in this model. And this is the counts on the left are the counts relative, um, relative to the vehicle. So again, the vehicle increases three, by three orders of magnitude over this the 24-hour infection period. Baseline counts are about five times ten to the six, uh, five times ten to the fifth. And um, linazolid shows a dose of responsive effect, vancomycin no effect. And the vancomycin derivatives, quite a potent effect. And, the, and again, now we are on the left-hand panel, we're looking at the difference in counts between the, the treatment group relative to the baseline counts. And, and you see that the control, levolinazolid, shows a significant reduction in counts relative to baseline at this high dose group of 100 mg per kick. And that the, the CBP vancomycin derivative, so a very significant reduction, two log 10 reduction relative to baseline at the 25 and 50 mg per kick dose groups. Um, and I'm gonna apologize, you're gonna see some problems with the formatting in the slides. It's a, it's some, um, it's a difficulty that we're having with the my slides in this, this um, webinar for um, format. Um, we'll try to get that corrected in the recorded version that we'll have online. All right. So another use of these um, slides of these uh, these models is to look at the time kill activity or the bactericidal activity and rates of kill in the model. And this is a study that was conducted by Kevin Krause's group um, at Acadian conducted that for them. In this model. Um, we in infected the mice at time zero and dosed one time with a, um, a Cajun 975. And then animals were sacrificed at time points. A and the bacterial counts were measured with the dilution plating. And we can see uh, and different dose groups. Here's the vehicle. You can see the increase in counts over the infection time course in the vehicle untreated group. Whereas the lower dose of ACHN 975 um, um, also has bac um, bacterial growth over time, but the higher dose groups of 10 and 30 milligrams per kilogram result in a rapid bactericidal effect. It's very encouraging to see. All right, and going to the next slide. So the thigh and lung infection models are very important for rank ordering hits, as I as described in um, studies like that of the Scripps group, and as are very important for um, lead optimization and comparing test articles for their potency. But, but this, the lung and thigh models are also very important for establishing this exposure response correlations for predicting efficacious doses in human. And so they have very much a translational role and a clinical development role. So I wanted to go through these types of PKPD eva um, evaluations to estimate target um, exposure values. And it, it, it is based on the principles of PKPD, um, and that is, the, that the antimicrobial efficacy is the outcome of the test article exposure. That is the dose in the pharmacokinetics and also 
the organism susceptibility, the MIC. And there's PKPD parameters. One is the time above the MIC, the AUC over MIC, or the CMAX over MIC that a test article make that will correlate with the efficacy in mice and also in humans. So in this graph, it's showing the concentration time profile. And it, as expected, after dosing, you have an increase in the concentration in plasma that decreases over time. The time above MIC is the time that the concentration is above the MIC. There's the Cmax over MIC value. That's the maximum concentration over the MIC. And then there's the AUC over the MIC value. And these are one of these three parameters is best describes the activity of an antimicrobial agent, both in mice and in humans. So this slide outlines how we go about defining these uh, PKPD correlations and the estimation for human dose exposures. So these, these studies are conducted with a series of four experiments. The, the first is an efficacy dose ranging experiment um, in which you have a broad titration of the test article and looking at the dose responsive effect to define the steep region of the dose curve. And this example is in the thigh infection model with Pseudomonas aeruginosa, ATCC strain 27853. And this example is with ceftazidime. All right, so the first study is the dose ranging. The second study is the pharmacokinetic evaluation, again, measuring the concentration as a function of time. And in a PKPD evaluation, the pharmacokinetics are measured in the infection model because the infection can alter the pharmacokinetics. So in a, in a generally, a range of doses that span the steep region of the dose response curve are used. So with the PK and the dose ranging results established, then one does a dose fractionation where a range of dose concentrations are tested at either one or at, or at, at, at different dose frequencies, equally divided dose frequencies. Um, and then the data, that is the, the efficacy and the pharmacokinetics, are then um, and analyzed, and the PK, the, the, the area under the curve, the Cmax, and the time above MIC are estimated at all of the dose concentrations tested, and then the data are fit into curves, looking at the bacterial counts, as a function of the PKPD parameter. So in this case on the left, the time above MIC. Um, and then on the right, the AUC over the MIC or the CMAX over the MIC. The data are fit and the regression is, is evaluated to determine the goodness of the fit. And for ceftazidine, you see that the goodness of fit using AUC over MIC or Cmax over MIC is quite poor with R squared values of 27 or, or 40%, um, 40%. Whereas the time above MIC had a much better fit with an R squared value of 86%, consistent with the published literature that the time above MIC correlates with efficacy for ceftazidine, acephalosporin, beta-lactam antibiotic. And we can estimate then with the data, the values for the, the time above MIC that it can then 
achieve bacteriostasis, one or two log 10 killing. And these are the free fraction count values. Um, and those, those correlations for killing correlate with efficacy in humans and are used to establish dose targets. And because of the importance of, you know, this is clearly a very important measurement. And so there are now guidelines for how to conduct these ex experiments to generate robust data. And these guidelines um, cover the pre um, preparation of the inoculum, the bacterial burden, the time for the um, infection period, and the, the, the numbers and types of strains to be used. And this is in order to generate more reproducible and reliable results. And the IMI combined incubator accelerator ha um, has organized workshops to review these guidelines and establish best practices. And these have been um, conducted with input from the, the industry. And the guidelines include, again, the inoculum, the weight to render the mites neutropenic, the bacterial burden at the time of dosing, and how to prepare the inoculum. And this information will be um, um, published. It's available from the IMI, and they really are available to you for as a resource for guidance on how to conduct these important studies. Oh, so to, to recap the key points, the thigh and lung models are the workhorse models for drug discovery and aid in the establishment of doses for the clinical development. Um, the PKPD parameters, that's time above MIC, AUC or MIC, and CMAX MIC correlate with the efficacy in mice and humans. And that there's now estab established um, protocol guidelines for conducting these models. And I want to point out that, that having access to a, a variety of clinical isolates with established infection models will be very helpful to the drug discovery community so that you can have a range of organisms with different varied MIC values to do these, these studies. Now, now, moving on then to the survival models with immunocompetent mice. These, these models are used to test, test the protective efficacy against the lethal pneumonia peritonitis or bacteremia model. And they use um, immune competent mice in order to assess how the Im um, immune system contributes to the therapeutic effect. So I'm gonna give you an example with the lung infection model, and I'm sorry for the formatting on the slide. In this model, the animals are in um, immunocompetent balbsy mice are infected intranasally, and then test article is administered starting one hour after infection. In the case of amicacin, it's administered twice, and then animals are observed for survival over a seven-day infection period. Tissue may be harvested uh, at time points during this um, treatment period um, to measure bacterial enumeration in, in the tissue. So we always start off these mo the model development with an inoculum titration to determine the LD90, not an inoculum that's too high, because then the, the system is overburdened and, and impossible to treat. Not an inoculum that's too low, because then the, uh, the counts aren't enough and the, and the model is not sufficiently reliable. And we need to hire a larger number of animals to get significant data. All right, so in this model, the treatment with amicacin administered twice daily um, for one day results in significant protective efficacy. Um, at the higher doses of 100, 300, and, and 1,000 mg per kg, but the lower dose of 30 mg per kg is not effective. And the amication treatment also results in a dose responsive um, reduction in the bacterial counts in the lung tissue. And we're particularly proud of, of this model because we've been, customers have been asking us for models with immune competent mice to look at test articles active against Pseudomonas um, for, for evaluations of biotherapeutics and bacteriophage. And it's really been difficult for us in this use of this combined approach of looking at survival as well as bacterial burden 
um, with an LD90 inoculum has been most successful. So I'm also going to talk about a, a peritonitis model. The peritonitis model in this example is conducted with a KPC2 producing pneumonia, Klebsiella pneumonia strain. Um, it, it's conducted basically the same way. You infect with, with a particular inoculum defined with, a LD, uh, with an inoculum titration. Uh, animals are treated one hour after infection, and then survival is monitored for seven days. And in this model, the LD90 was established at, at 10 to the fourth CFU per mouse, and ticocycline demonstrated dose-responsive protective efficacy. And this model has been used now to evaluate efficacy uh, of bacteriophage. In this study, the bacteriophage were administered um, in, either in the presence or absence of ticocycline. Dosing started at one hour after an infection and then was conducted twice daily for a total of five days. Ticocycline was administered only once. The phage were administered twice daily and animals were observed for a total of seven days. And the phage demonstrated protective efficacy, both with ticocycline. Ticocycline was dosed at a very low dose amount that was um, not effective on its own, but the phage were active both in the presence of the ticocycline low dose and in the absence uh, showing that this that bacteriophage actually can be act active and quite potent uh, in, in this type of disseminated infection model. So then to recap on the models with immunocompetent mice, um, we were able to establish Pseudomonas lung infection models using an LD90 inoculum. We've, been, we've established the models with carbapenem resistant strains, two different resistant strains, as well as drug susceptible strains. The establishment and confirmation of the LD90 inoculum assures the reproducibility, and it assures that the models are sensitive to inhibition or, or um, antibacterial effects, and it contains the group size and that the infection models with immunocompetent mice are useful for evaluating bacteriophage and other biotherapeutics, and also antibiotics. A number of customers that are working with antibiotics do prefer to test in the peritonitis model or bacteremia models as well. So I wanted to then go talk about resources available to you for drug discovery testing. We talked about um, the importance of the MIC of a test article against the strains as being an important parameter for efficacy in these models. And thus, you want to be testing your therapeutic candidate with a few different isolates, clinical isolates, and some standard strains that have a range of MIC values. Well, where do you, where do you get these strains? And so I wanted to point out that the ATCC and the FDA and CDC antimicrobial resistance isolate bank have organisms available. The AR bank, the organisms are available at no cost to you except for shipment. And we have validated models with organisms from the AR bank and the list of organisms are available here. And example data can be found on our website here in orange. And you can obtain information from the strains from the, the providers, the ATCC and the CDC website. And here are the URLs. It's a tremendous resource and can save you a lot of time in the establishment of these infection models to know which organisms actually work in an infection model. Another resource for you is NIAID's preclinical services. So the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Disease provides free preclinical testing services 
Um, and it's a suite of services to support the development of therapeutics, vaccines, and diagnostics. And investigators in academia, nonprofit organizations, industry, the government, um, you can request services th um, through NIAID. And you don't need to be a grantee of NIAID or you don't have to be funded by a NIAID grant. Um, this is, URL can take you to the NIAID website for information on this. Um, and NIAID has given a webinar for GuardP on their services that you can find in this particular link. And Pharmacology Discovery Services, the group I, rec um, I represent, they are a proud service provider for NIAID's preclinical services. All right, so in, I want to give my credits now. So first of all, the experiments that I discussed above, um, they were funded by federal funds through NIAID's preclinical services, these particular contra um, contract numbers. And the following individuals from Pharmacology Discovery Services contributed to this work, as well as uh, the University of Florida, Florida Jurgen Belita, Druvit, Suteria, Yanyan Zhao, and Rav Shah, they contributed to the modeling for the PKDPD, the um, study designs, and the evaluation of the data. And BioMX contributed data on the phage and the um, lovely analysis of the graphs and presented that work at the um, World Microbe Forum. And I, and I wanna really um, give a call out to Yorani Arapo for helping me with my slides. And then also special thanks to Raquel Arazuria, who helped from IMI Combine, who provided slides on IMI's effort for, for standardized methods for PKPD. And I want to thank you all as, as a representative for Pharmacology Discovery Services. I want to thank you all for your attention, and I welcome your questions. Okay, Lynn, thank you for that. A wonderful summary, um, very clear. Uh, there are some questions uh, that are already have already been posted. We're going to hold those until um, after the next talk, but please keep them rolling in and we will do our very best to have a discussion and answer all of those. But in the meantime, uh, my pleasure to introduce Jennifer Herman. I know I haven't said your surname properly, Jennifer, but um, I'm sorry about that. So you're, uh, Jennifer is a senior scientist at the Helmholtz Institute for Pharma Pharmaceutical Research. Uh, she has trained uh, or completed research training in both the UK and in Germany. Um, she's interested in antimicrobial discovery and development, including natural products. Um, Jennifer's interest, um, in, interested in the development of new assays uh, or, or experimental models such as the zebrafish and as on that topic she's going to speak to us uh, today about the new models that we need for compounds that are coming through. Jennifer, over to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you William for the kind introduction. Of course also Victor for, for inviting me. Um, welcome everyone. Um, so today I'm um, give you an introduction to the zebrafish larvae model which we um, mainly, mainly used as a screening tool in antibiotic drug discovery. Um, so just to give you a, like a very um, yeah, rough overview of what we are doing at the Helmholtz Institute of Pharmaceutical Research in, in Saarland. Um, so our work is uh, centered around anti-infectives and one of the major sources that we use for those are um, so-called myxobacteria. So these are um, soil dwelling uh, bacteria which are a rich source of um, new uh, antibiotic compounds and then we um, use a, cut a lot of uh, technology to actually bring those um, early stage compounds to the next level. Um, and within my team our main research focus is the um, yeah, studying antibacterial mechanisms so we're aiming at elucidating novel targets of course, when we are lucky, um, novel targets that also overcome common antimicrobial resistance. And the overall goal, uh, which we're also pursuing together with the German Center of Infection Research, is to ready those natural product-based antibiotics uh, for the translation um, into clinics. Um, so as you all know, um, the Basically, the development of, um, of antibiotic molecules um, is, is very lengthy. It's also very 
um, cost intense and um, this is even accompanied with um, quite high failure rates along the way. Um, so within our labs, we're um, mostly in this um, early area. So we do um, basically cover everything from um, initial screening up to lead optimization. And um, as you all know, so um, most of the work is then still done in vitro, uh, but of course we also um, employ first in vivo models. And um, since our natural products that we initially isolate, um, they're quite precious. So there's a lot of, um, yeah, we put a lot of effort in, in isolating those, but still in the early stages, um, we typically end up with only low milligram amounts which sometimes hampers um, the screening in, um, for example, rodent models. And this is how we came up with the idea to actually use um, ziprafish embryo models. Um, and other advantages of these models are that we, by this, can reduce the actual number of animal experiments because it's important to know that when you screen in ziprafish larvae, uh, when they're younger than five days uh, post-fertilization, uh, at least to European law, they are not considered as animal experiments. Uh, what we also think is because we employ those models quite early, um, so even in the very early stages of, of screening, that by this we can uh, directly generate higher quality hits. And of course, um, since we reduce the, the number of, um, for example, mouse models, we can also overall reduce our costs of the um, discovery process. Um, so I'm going to start with two examples of two of our um, antibiotic development programs where we actually um, use the ziprofish and after that I'm going uh, a bit more into detail with the uh, ziprofish model. Um, so this is um, a project, uh, it's um, the compound or the lead compound is called chlorotonil, so it's um, also isolated from the myxobacteria which you already mentioned. Um, and we're trying to develop the, the chlorotonils into new lead structures uh, for treating vancomycin resistant enterococci and um, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Um, so the compound itself, uh, we obtain by fermentation on large scale. So we isolate the parent molecule on gram scale. And after that, we uh, went through um, semi-synthesis approaches and by this tackle basically um, all positions um, on the molecule. And by now we got a front runner in hand, which we call WH1A2. So we still need to look for a proper naming, um, which shows significantly improved properties, um, specifically the uh, physicochemical properties um, were much, um, uh, much better, uh, but it also shows better biological properties. Um, and one model which we used along the way is the uh, ziprafish model of uh, VRV infection. Um, and this was actually quite nice because we used it um, at a very early stage. Um, so basically after having um, screened the MIC on VRE um, to select the most promising analogs, which show already um, activity in this very early stage in vivo model. Um, so the second, let's say, flagship project uh, we're currently pursuing are the cystobactamids. Um, again, a natural product class from uh, from mycobacteria. Um, we were able to identify the target as um, bacterial gyrase and topoisomerase 4 through analyzing the self-resistance mechanisms that we found in the producer strain. Um, however, in this case, fermentation was not really feasible because the amounts we could obtain were, were minimal. Um, so we went through total synthesis and by now we have more than 200 analogs generated, which then also enabled um, that we progressed with the class into lead optimization. And the reason why we're so interested in the cystobactamids are for sure their biological properties. So they have a broad antibacterial um, activity not only against gram positives, but importantly also against um, hard to treat multi-drug resistant gram negative bacteria. And we could also already show um, that they're active in vivo in routine mouse models. 
Um, so while optimizing or synthetically optimizing the class, <clears throat> we employed uh, basically two models. So here on the um, upper right, um, so we used a so-called cardiotoxicity um, model in zebra fish larvae to de-risk uh, potential toxicity issues in the class. So I'm also going to explain the model in a bit um, more in detail. And importantly, uh, we also studied the actual metabolism of the zystobactimids in vivo, also in zebrafish larvae. Um, and we were able to achieve metabolite identification and clearly pinpoint um, so-called metabolic soft spots. Um, and then we went through new synthetic cycles and actually used this information to further optimize on the actual metabolic stability of the zystobactimids. So coming now to the um, zebra fish. Um, so I'm just going to give a very general brief introduction. Um, so here you see a picture of, um, of our facility. So the <clears throat> zebra fish are quite easily maintained. Um, so we have them in, in individual tanks, which each holds uh, approximately 20 um, adult fish. And um, since we only work with the embryos and larvae, so we just house those um, adult animals to actually produce then eggs, uh, which we can use for our experiments. And here you see a typical setup um, of a mating cage. Um, so you put this thing a bit tilted to actually mimic a shore region because this is where uh, zebra fish in a natural habitat would typically mate. And so this um, more bluish fish, so this is a, a female and a more reddish uh, one is, is a male. And once they mate, so the eggs will drop down through this um, um, yeah, through this layer here so that we can actually collect them. And then the embryo development is quite fast. So the embryo is fully developed already two days after fertilization. Um, and then it will grow to a larvae. Um, and after five days, um, you will find a larva with a completely developed organ system and importantly, um, also an immune system. Um, and uh, another reason um, why we think that the zebra fish is a, a good model because it uh, was shown that it's uh, quite similar to humans um, on a genetic level. So this is given by approximately 70%. And if you then just look at genes which are uh, somehow related to, to human disease, um, the similarity is even higher. Um, also, um, there's a broad range of genetic tools available, uh, which also facilitates model development. And yeah, I already mentioned this. <clears throat> Another reason uh, why we see the model as advantages is that it's not considered as an um, animal testing procedure um, if you use larvae which are younger than five days po post fertilization. Um, so coming now to the individual models that we're using. Um, so the most easiest one um, is an early toxicity model. Um, so we use this because we sometimes found some discrepancies um, between typical in vitro testing uh, of antibiotics, for example, done in Hep G2 cells, um, and then actual in vivo toxicity, for example, um, in mice. And this is true in both directions but that there's sometimes um, a discrepancy. And this is why we additionally, um, to typical HEPG2 screening, also do toxicity, toxicity screening um, in the organism. Um, so here on the bottom, <clears throat> you see a normally um, developed embryo over time. So it's still in its egg shell. And then we would add the compounds to the surrounding water. And then on the upper panel, um, you see that this is a very fast killing compound. So basically the complete Embryos are fully disintegrated. Um, and then in the middle, this is, let's say, more mechanistically a more interesting phenotype because this compound did not kill the embryo but uh, led to um, severe um, yeah, developmental uh, toxic effects. As it's also quite tedious to screen, like each um, single treated um, embryo uh, manually by microscopy. And then judge uh, what kind of phenotype it is. We are currently working together with CISPA, which is uh, um, so we are neighbors on, on Saarland campus. 
um, and the goal is that we um, set up completely automated routines not only for the image acquisition but also for the actual um, data analysis to be able to very early on detect um, for example such effects. Um, so we also have more um, let's say detailed toxicity models um, so we are working on, on several ones. So here I just uh, pick two examples. Um, what you see here is a transgenic line and a uh, liver enzyme is, uh, um, um, is coupled to a DS red. So this is why you see a, a red fluorescence which depicts um, the liver of, of the individual larvae. If you then treat those larvae uh, with hepatotoxic compounds, uh, what you will find is that uh, you see a significantly decreased size of this uh, liver area, for example, here after treatment with valproic acid. And this is what we then actually quantify and assign as a hepatotoxic effect. Um, a second model um, in which we either use also uh, transgenic lines uh, with, uh, with a certain marker labeled with M cherry, but but we sometimes also use just uh, wild type lines um, is the cardiotoxicity model. So here the main readout um, is the heartbeat um, and also the detection of arrhythmia. And for this we use a microscopic system which actually um, records videos and it will give you um, yeah automatically uh, basically the, the heartbeat rate or um, other uh, other things such as arrhythmia. And sometimes what is also quite obvious if you're dealing with cardiotoxic compounds that you see these pericardial edema, for example, um, you see this here in this varapamil treated fish. And interestingly, um, so we also validated this model by screening several compounds um, in this zipra fish model and compared data to typical in vitro acme. So in this case, this is the HERC um, assay. And here's an example where we screen three derivatives of a natural product class, whereas um, two of these derivatives were negative in the zipper fish model, and one was um, positive in terms of reducing the heartbeat. Um, and this correlated very well uh, with our findings from in vitro HERC screening. Um, yeah, since we're dealing with antibiotics, of course, we also do have um, several um, infection models in, in the fish. So here is a um, systemic infection model uh, with a vancomycin resistant Enterococcus, um, which is labeled with GFP. Um, and what you can see is um, that when we infect uh, the zebra fish with this uh, labeled Enterococcus, so already after 12 hours, uh, so post-infection, uh, we see a clear accumulation of VRE um, in the heart region. And if we then wait uh, for another 12 hours, you see that uh, the fish is not too healthy anymore um, because the bacterial infection uh, spreads throughout the, the complete circulatory system. Um, and we use then this model to screen for antibiotic um, effects. Um, so here in the upper panel, um, this is the most simplest readout. So this is the quantification of GFP fluorescence as a measure um, of bacterial burden in the individual larvae. Um, so as expected, so here vancomycin, uh, because it's a VRE, was not effective. And three of our, or no, two of our experimental compounds actually showed a very significant reduction um, of GFP fluorescence, as well as our positive control linozolid. Um, and since we were, um, or we were a bit concerned that the fluorescence might not correlate with the actual bacterial burden, uh, we also validated the model um, by collecting the colony forming units of these treated larvae. And indeed, we could show that this correlates um, very well. So the actual CFU per, per larvae and the um, quantified GFP fluorescence. And it also correlates ultimately with the um, survival rate. <clears throat> so an example for a local 
um, infection model, it's our Staph aureus um, saprofish model. Um, so here, um, we do not inject the, the bacteria into the into the bean, but we inject it locally into the yolk sac, um, as seen here. So in this case, the Staphylococcus strain is, um, um, is labeled with um, M. cherry, and um, the infection more or less uh, stays there with only very little um, additional foci of infection. And after this stage, um, the embryo will also die. So this is the, um, let's say, endpoint um, of the of the infection. Um, because it's a local infection model, we thought it might be also interesting to actually study um, administration routes for for antibiotics, um, and we used um, three reference antibiotics, linezolid, ciprofloxacin, and vancomycin. And here, um, or basically we selected those because they have different molecular weights and also different um, physical chemical properties. And um, we administered those either also through microinjection into the yolk or in the caudal vein, or through the most commonly used bathwater um, immersion. And what you can see, what or what what we saw, and we found it quite interesting, uh, is that linezolid was effective in uh, reducing the bacterial burden in the yolk sac through all through uh, administration routes. Um, however, for ciprofloxacin, um, the bathwater immersion didn't work, and for vancomycin, only uh, the local treatment into the yolk did work. Um, so this was not our, let's say, desired outcome because, as you can imagine, it's the, in terms of assay speed and, and uh, turnaround, um, it's most easy if if you can just put your compounds in in the water instead of doing the microinjection. And oops. And for um, giving you an impression uh, that the microinjection is indeed quite tedious for these tiny larvae, so here's a short video. Um, so this is the microinjection needle and this small uh, transparent thingies. So these are the saprofish larvae, so they need to be all individually um, adjusted. Um, and then you can also imagine that it's not so easy in, in these tiny larvae to actually um, go, for example, into the caudal vein. Um, yeah, but um, still, um, we, we consider this meanwhile um, as a very important factor um, because most people still screen their compounds by just adding it to, to the water. Um, and in our hands, this often did not work. So we looked um, deeper into this. And we did this uh, particularly in the course of um, DMPK studies, uh, which we also coupled to our toxicity and infection models to study the, the metabolism and also the distribution of investigational um, new antibiotics. So we developed a routine workflow um, for several different compound classes, not only natural products, but also some, some synthetic ones. And we started out uh, typically with um, administrating those either through microinjection into different vital organs of the larvae or through the conventional treatment, uh, just through the water medium. Um, and then we screened um, for, for metabolites using LC high resolution MS, and then aimed at identifying metabolites. And then the next step, um, so we were also interested where actually those metabolites can be found in the fish. So we were interested in, in the distribution of the parent drug, but also in the distribution of metabolites, which for example, could lead to a toxic buildup um, in certain organs. So we um, by now set up a routine workflow um, for mass spectrometry imaging of these um, of these tiny saprofish larvae, which was um, yeah two of the force I would say, but uh, we now have, have our routines um, established, and we can now screen basically in cryo section of these tiny larvae where the parent compound um, and the metabolites can be found. And this also helped us a lot in understanding um, why, for example, uh, certain administration routes um, are more favorable than, than others, because we can also uh, quantify the, the uptake 
um, of our target drugs in the in the fish. Um, so yeah, this is my my last slide. Um, so um, this is just an example of an uh, early proof of concept study that that we performed uh, with a synthetic uh, cannabinoid. Um, and here our primary goal was initially to to compare the zebra fish larvae to different models which are routinely used um, in the clinics, uh, specifically in, in drug screening when when they are dealing with these uh, new psychoactive um, compounds. Um, so we compared. Um, our data in the zebra fish larvae to HIPAA-RG cells. And importantly, and also luckily, um, we also had um, data from, from humans, which were just freshly generated um, in the clinics. Um, and this allowed us to um, yeah, characterize the overlap of metabolites that, that we found. And um, interestingly, the zebra fish model was, um, was performing very well. Uh, so we see a very large overlap uh, to human metabolites and also importantly the zebra fish larvae do not only produce phase one metabolites but they're also able to do conjugation uh, reactions um, as part of phase two metabolisms. And then here um, are some exemplary MS images um, because we also here we were interested in where the metabolites actually accumulate and this synthetic cannabinoid um, is quite lipophilic, and this is why it was not too surprising um, that we found the majority of the compound actually um, in the yolk sac after water immersion. And later on in the subsequent study, we, uh, we further optimized the procedure and injected this cannabinoid because we wanted to make sure that it actually gets into the circulation um, to ensure um, yeah, an efficient metabolism to further improve uh, the predictiveness of, um, of the zebra fish model. Yeah, here are my, my acknowledgements. Um, so yeah, of course, I want to, talk, uh, I want to thank mostly, mostly my team. So this is all a team effort. So the zebra fish facility was uh, established in 2017 and everyone from the team has also other projects, but everyone uh, always helps in, in keeping it going and improving our models. And I would like um, particularly to thank Jonas Baumann. So he's our, our lab manager. Um, I would also like to thank Felix Deschner, Franziska Fries, uh, Sari Rashid, Timo Risch and Philipp Schippers um, because they contributed a lot to, to all the models um, that I presented today. And yeah, I thank you for your attention and looking forward to your questions. Great. Thank you very much, Jennifer. It was um, uh, interesting and um, it's been a while since I've heard a talk about zebrafish. So, that, so there you go. So I think we have slightly under half an hour now um, to try and address some of the questions that are appearing in the, in, in, the, in the question. We tried to answer some of them, but Victor tells us that you can't see some of the answers. So I'm going to try to clump the questions together rather than go through them one by one. So first of all, Lynn, I think um, this first one's to you and really it, 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 it strikes to the heart of the experimental conditions that you cite and the justification for those. Uh, so there are quite a few questions about the justification for a two hour delay, one, justification for whether to use immunosuppression and the types of immunosuppression that are used the justification for some of the endpoints, um, stasis versus logarithmic killing, various orders of survival, for example. And also, I didn't hear actually either of you talk about the emergence of drug resistance on therapy and, and trying to understand resistance liabilities. And so maybe, Lynn, first of all, over to you just to try and respond to those in general. I can help you through them again if you didn't get okay. all of that. Okay, yeah, I, I will need you to help me. The first one was the time points, when to start dosing. And it, it, so for the thigh and lung infection models, those are really industry standard. And the reason for sticking with them is that there's a, you have a nice comparison to 
established with data with with approved drugs and and those and since those models following that dose schedule are used for estimating human dose and their and correlation with human dose and we know very well that those that that um, efficacy over from that 24 hour dose administration period starting two hours after infection that that very much pre predicts efficacy in the clinic um, it's it's quite advantageous to us to follow those methods um, you can game the system by dosing earlier if you dose earlier then the 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 bacterial counts at the time of dosing are lower and many test articles have an inoculum effect where the the lower the inoculum the more potent the ana the 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 um, activity you can delay dosing and that actually um, allows the infection to take further and and that's much harder to treat it's a it's a good idea to do that and many groups will do efficacy evaluations with um, delayed dosing um, and just be keeping in mind that you might not see efficacy that way uh, and, and, and may miss out on a potent compound uh, um, that where you see efficacy earlier. Um, I saw one question about can you dose at 30 minutes and, and yes one can dose at 30 minutes but again the, the counts won't be high enough. Um, the purpose for that two-hour period is it gives the bacteria a chance to grow, grow, grow before you start the dosing um, and, and establish those some, uh, 10 to the 6 baseline counts. Okay. All right. yep. So, Lynn, yeah, I mean, the analogy I always use is that it's like lighting a firecracker and having it in your hand, and you sort of have to get on with things, otherwise it quickly becomes untreatable. However, there are there are in larger animals. I know you're talking about mice, but you can wait a little longer in rabbit models, 24 hours, and you can get more maybe clinically faithful replicates if you do that. But um, you know, it's time and expense. So I agree with you completely about the two hours as standard, and yeah, um, you know, life's too short. Okay, so what about the immunosuppression part, Lynn? Well, again, the suppression, the, the, the cyclophosphamide at the dose system that used um, reduces the neutrophil counts to less than 100 per uh, cubic millimeters. So that, and, and that really makes the mice fully reasonably immune suppressed. The, the immune system isn't clearing the bacteria on their own. And again, there's phenomenal correlation of activity of antimicrobial agents um, under those conditions um, and the correlation of the, the antimicrobial effect and efficacy in humans. Um, sometimes customers want studies to be done with immune competent mice and uh, thinking that, well, it, it, humans are immune competent when you, you treat them, um, but it's really not about in, you know, using neutropenic animals isn't really about modeling the effect on neutropenic humans. It's it's really just a correlation of the ant, um, efficacy of reduction in bacterial counts um, due to exposure at the site of infection. So, Lynn, thank you for that. Can, uh, Jennifer, I might just bring you in here, and and because you alluded briefly, I think, to that the fish do have immune immune uh, effectors. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk about that just for a second? Just expand on that. Yeah, so it's um, so so we mostly study this in, in the context of uh, mucobacterial infection. Um, so I didn't show this model, but it's actually quite interesting um, because there's a mucobacterial species, it's um, marinum, uh, which where the fish is the natural host, so you can actually establish um, an infection. Um, and it's not only that you then have these uh, free-floating bacteria, but you will actually find granuloma-like structures, uh, which makes it quite nice. Of course, it's then also challenging for new antibiotics to, to clear these granuloma. And there it's um, very interesting because you can also clearly see, for example, the um, recruitment of macrophages to these uh, granuloma sites. Um, and what we're trying to establish right now is because, especially in TB therapy, 
it becomes more and more popular to actually target the the host instead of target um, or at least or additionally target the host instead of only targeting the the bacteria um, that we're trying to to screen compounds which are known effects on the immune system um, in this model so we okay. don't have data yet but I Hope it will be some interesting data at some point. Yeah, okay. Yeah, sort of, yeah, so that's an interesting uh, an interesting point, isn't it? Okay, back to you, Lynn, now. Just just clear up the confusion, which I, I understood what you said, but just so there's no confusion about the endpoint at 26 hours, you made a comment that that sheeted back to the, the two-hour controls rather than the 26-hour controls. Um, so the stasis line comes from the uh, the two hour control point. I think you said that clearly, but just to, just to clear that up, that that's the industry standard yeah. again. Um, it, that's not because that's written anywhere, or that's just the, that's just the way it is. Well, it's it's the industry standard, and it is written in many locations. Um, but dosing starts at two hours, and then it's a twenty four for the lung and thigh. It's a twenty four hour model for dosing the dose period. So then the dosing ends twenty four hours. And the do, the um, infection period ends 24 hours after dose initiation. Okay, right. So ho hopefully I, I can't okay. see who right put that in the in the question, but hopefully Lynn's response there has clear, just cleared that yeah. confusion up. So that's that's the critical thing. Okay, now to both of you about resistance generation. So Lynn, you show the fantastic list of multi-drug resistant pathogens that are available, but but what about you know the estimating and understanding resistance liability. There's no point in making a drug if you have rapid emergence of resistance. Do either of your model systems help in that regard? Thank you for asking that question. It's a really a, a good one, an exciting one. And 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 yes, a, yeah, one can look at resistance and emergence in vivo. It's not trivial. Uh, Arnold Louis and George Desano's group have done uh, some very elegant work on that, and there's other groups as well. Um, and, and so one can take bacteria recovered from the animals and, 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 and plate them for onto selective medium to count not only bacterial counts on a medium lacking drug, but also bacterial counts on medium containing drugs to look at the percentage or the frequency of, of resistant variants. Not trivial because in order to see resistance, you have to have a high burden of bacteria in there. And by the time you're done um, treating, um, the counts become low, hopefully. Yeah, yeah so for Jennifer, the, Jennifer, yeah, so for the zebra fish, unfortunately, I have to say that they're, um, I would not consider them as a very useful model to, to study the in vivo development of resistance because typically um, the infection is quite fast and then also fastly. Um, uh, lethal. Um, so it would be quite challenging, I, I think, to specifically select for in vivo resistance in the model. However, we do have um, quite a lot of experience on actually also comparing in vitro resistance mechanisms and in vivo mechanisms in, in mice. And there um, I found especially the, the mouse models um, very useful because, for example, we use them um, to actually confirm that the in vitro um, resistance mechanisms that we identify are also relevant in vivo because this is not not always mm -hmm. given you because you in vitro you work with very artificial conditions to actually tweak the bacteria into um, into being resistant um, we, we typically use um, mouse models to to confirm such phenotypes and what we also quite routinely do um, if you have a major uh, resistant phenotype we are also interested in whether it would be fit in vivo, um, so we did several challenging studies in, in mice where we compared the parental strain to the uh, mutated strain and, and checked in vivo uh, which one overgrows the other. Yeah, you know, I also wonder just listening to your talk and your response to that question, Jennifer, is the beauty of the zebrafish is you can see everything and, and that yeah. if you had report, you spoke about GFPs, but if you had reporters for resistance mechanisms, you could see dynamic resistance mechanisms in real time, couldn't you? So anyway, that's, um, yeah, that's just true. popped into my mind. But Jennifer, so that's a nice sort of introduction to a series of questions for you. And there are just some additional questions that I've just seen pop into the chat. So we're all interested um, in 
uh, a few, I think, practical questions about fish. Um, so what about the cost, first of all? I mean, is it, is it cheaper to have, mm -hmm. is it cheaper to have a, a, lab, a lab full of fish compared with a lab full of mice? I, so I'm, <laughs> I do not have too many insights into, into mouse facilities. Also, we do have one at, at the center, um, but I would say from the running costs, uh, it's much cheaper. Uh, because, uh, for example, we have a, from the picture that I showed, so this was only uh, a fourth of our complete facility, and this can be all run by one technician. Um, okay. So on a, let's say, six to seven hour stay, and then also the weekend routine, so we, we do have those, um, yeah. but it's just, let's say, two hours for, for one person to come in and, and check the, the health and, and do the feeding. So yeah. the running costs are pretty low um, so the major cost driver is still the personnel but I, I guess this is with any animal facility you will find. I'm going, to, I'm going to ask you to respond to Jeffrey Ambrosio's question in just a second but just in terms of personnel does it take how many years does it take to be able to inject into a tiny little <laughs> I still that, can't do it. <laughs> right, there you go. Okay, so so a long time then, right? Do you, maybe have you ever tried a, a tail vein? Is it easier than a tail vein of a mouth? Yeah. So I, I so what I because I also uh, supervise quite many PhD students and master students, and and for me right now what I can see it's also um, some personalities can do it better if you're re really calm and you just take your time. So it takes I would say maybe two months. Okay. Until you're you're okay, or okay. yeah, I know what you mean. So the easiest thing is the York sack. So basically, this more or less everyone can do within a week. But the the vein is quite tricky. Yes. Yeah. So so I think so. So Jeffrey Ambrose asked a question about some of the compounds that are used. So what what about if it was a very insoluble compound, and this is the same for a mouse as well, and you've got to put it with DMSO? Does that work in a in a in a fish? Yes, um, so actually I would need to look up the, the maximum amount of DMSO that we're currently using, but it's um, for sure much higher than what you would use in a, in a mouse. Um, okay. So I, I think we can go up to 25% for yeah. the injections, but we also only inject four nanoliters maximum. Okay. Um, unfortunately, um, the fish do not tolerate too well uh, other typical um, solvents for very insoluble compounds. For example, PEC is quite lethal. So this is a um, typical thing we would use in a mouse. Methanol? Um, so methanol um, is Melts fine. Them. Also, yeah, or, or ethanol, let's say. So methanol okay. we try to avoid, but ethanol would be fine. But this you cannot use for the, uh, the micro-injection because it would just leak out of the... The micro needle, but it's an option when you want to do the immersion treatment. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I think also I think Jeffrey had a question about he's trying to imagine the how you set these studies up. So you know a, a mouse cage is pretty straightforward. You have a cage, and you know that's how you maybe randomize or set the experiment up, and you can keep track of the experiment. That will. What about a tank full of fish? How do you do that? Um, so we randomize, let's say, in more or less naturally. So of course we have a full track um, of our generation, so we can we can mix um, as we like, also from from different sources, the the same strains. Um, so within one tank, uh, we keep the uh, females and males mixed. Um, and when we prepare um, embryos, we always take the complete tank, and then let's say take randomly uh, five pairs. And then pool uh, from those pairs all, all the eggs. Okay. And I think this is how we get our randomization. It's not as let's say the, the tracking is not as easy as with a as a mouse, but but you can randomize, yeah. Okay. And finally, Jennifer, there's an interesting question that's come in from R Rolando Ibarra. I hope I said your name properly, Rolando. Um so Clearly, your talk was about human disease and health and antimicrobial development for humans. But of course, this is environmental component as well. And do you think that the fish is a is a useful model for environmental contamination with antimicrobial compounds, which is an increasing concern and worry? 
So it's for sure um, very popular in environmental toxicity. So there it's, um, let's say, much more advanced than in the in the field of anti-infectives. Um, so people use it for, um, let's say, toxicology uh, assessments. Um, I'm not quite aware whether there are, let's say, more specific models for such uh, environmental pollutants, which are more in the, in the field than of, of antimicrobials. Um, but for sure, these ecotoxicity screens are, are broadly run. Okay. Okay. Um, there's a few more questions coming in, so that's great. Thanks. Keep them coming in. We have another nine minutes. Okay. So, Lynn, I'm going to um, come back to you. And I was sort of interested in the in vitro triage that you sort of presented before you go into a mouse. You have to have, you know, I think you had five things up there and you put the PK up there quickly, early. It, yeah. It, go on. There's PK screening and then there's the PK and the infection models, but PK so screening. Go on, tell, tell us what you yeah. mean by PK screening. PK screening, it's a mouse. I, I I wasn't trying to show them as being in vitro. There's It's a series of in vitro and in vivo tests. So before going and doing an efficacy study, um, I do recommend doing a P mouse PK with the low, you know, standard one mig, five mig per kg dose, um, looking at IV and and oral to look at oral bioavailability if you're seeking that as an indication um, and IV to see if you can dose by the IV route um, and to test the route that you plan to dose by um, because we have more more customers that end up being dissatisfied because they don't do a PK at first and they they don't understand then why their compound isn't active and and it may be that the the um, it didn't have sufficient systemic um, distribution and it didn't have, or it was cleared too rapidly. So the PK short half-life and they didn't dose frequently enough. Um, mm -hmm. So definitely PK early on is really helpful. Mm -hmm. But on the other, go on, so, sorry, Lynn, go on. I didn't mean to. And then tolerability, tolerability assessment is really helpful because um, if you know the maximum tolerated dose, you can dose at just below the maximum tolerated dose and 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 have the best chances for success in, in observing efficacy in your in vivo study. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this is for me. This is a difficult one because to go to the PK first means you have to have an assay, and you often get a delay between trying to do the experiment and getting the results and then interpreting them. And then, of course, you're assuming that it the plasma PK, which is all you really have, then drives everything. And that harks back to a question that was asked about BAL and and the lung importance of BAL and the, and the lung. So that these these pro and then, but to your point, that if there's a half-life of only a five seconds, that that's unlikely to do anything important in a in a mouse. So I, there, so I'm interested in that tap that you know companies only, or especially small biotech companies, often have only so much time and money, and they've got to get to a place where there's value, and that that's really some evidence of in vivo efficacy. So. I'm interested, Lynn, in what you say in terms of how to get that step quickly. And I'm also interested, Jennifer, whether the fish helps in that sense, it provides understanding, but does it give a sense of value, if you know what I mean, to the compound, that it's going to be a real and human medicine, um, de-risking that step? Maybe Lynn, you first then. Okay, so for, for PK assessment, the CROs, that there's CROs that are experts with PK bioanalysis. You know, for our, our group does PK with bioanalysis and doing PK screen. And you send the compound a small amount, and we can test at a, a, a reasonably low dose of one or five mg per kg uh, and have the results back to you in two to three weeks. And, and so it doesn't hold up the progress too much. And then it tells you, do you have a half-life of five minutes? Um, and you should wait until you have another compound. Or if it, it tells you that you have a half-life of 30 minutes and maybe you want to dose more frequently in your in your in efficacy study. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so for the for the zebra fish, yeah. so from my experience, 
um, that they, when we have an interesting compound class because of its mechanism um, spectrum of activity and it fails in the fish, uh, we still go on with it. Um, so I, I think in this respect, uh, the zebra fish is not a good predictor in case you do not see anything. You cannot be sure that it's, um, you, you might see still efficacy in a, in a road model. Yeah. On the other hand, um, we value compounds which do show efficacy in the zebra fish. So this is a plus uh, for yeah. any compound class. And for, let's say, more detailed assessment in, in terms of ATMI properties in the zebra yeah. fish model. So in my experience, it's most useful if you compare derivatives of the same class. So for example, if you know that you have a metabolic instability liability, the zebra yeah. fish is very useful in, in screening and comparing similar molecules with simi similar properties. But if you compare completely different molecules with different weights and, and properties, um, I would say it's maybe not too predictive. Yeah. All right. So, so, so Jennifer, what, what, what if God P had invited uh, a wax moth um, sort of specialist or convert, um, which, you know, the, there are lots of those people. So how does your model compare with Galeria? <laughs> I was as much better, of well, course. Other than being much better, of course, yeah. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> No, so I um, so I, I think just the let's say the organism, the larvae yeah. is is more complex in terms of its organ systems, the organ functions, the immune system. So this has clearly some advantages. Um, but I fully do understand um, the the work done with with Galeria, mm -hmm. uh, because it's just so easy and it's a very um, accessible. Um, initial in vivo model, especially for for people who might not have like an immediate yeah. access to a to a animal facility, you can just buy them at a pet shop, basically. Yeah. Um, and also at uh, at Helmholtz in, in Saarland, we used them, and they were extremely successful in in early screening for antivirulence compounds, for okay. example. And it's easier, of course, than and you can inject them much easier than zebra fish. So. So, so, so maybe it is that there are, you know, there are, as with everything, strengths and limitations of all of these yeah. these models, and and they that, that your zebrafish complement Galeria in very early screening and understanding. Um, maybe 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 some of that with your work will become clearer with the, the passage of time. So, um, Lynn, I don't know if you're still there, but just when someone, yeah. when, a, when a sponsor approaches you and Jennifer, listen to this question as well, how much compound do you need for, for your systems? How much, what's the answer to that? Jennifer, first of all. We need micrograms, so people okay. <laughs> typically okay. like these answers. Yeah. Micro, micrograms, and what's your answer, Lynn? Um, the few MIGs for a PK study for efficacy, it just depends on the dose amount, you know, so, it, and it, you know, it can be quite low, um, you know, so, but it's in, it's starting from a few migs up to, you know, grams, depending okay. on the dose frequency, dose amount, et yeah. cetera. Yeah, the size so it's, of it's, always, it's always the first question that a, a customer asks, and it's always one that I have to calculate, actually. Um, okay. Okay, so but there is an important difference there. It's an order of magnitude difference, isn't there, in terms of, you still both to have, Pure compound or workable compound, or you know, but 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 much less to get into the fish at least. All okay. right, um, Victor, are you there? I think seventeen twenty nine where I live anyway. Um, how how are we do you, do you want a minute or two to to wrap up? I think I think Victor. Well, I, I mean, just thank you very much to Jennifer and Lynn for your wonderful presentations and your very erudite answers to a lot of questions there that, um, you know, are, are, are difficult and complex. Thank you. I really enjoyed that. Maybe, uh, Victor, I'll hand, hand back to you now. Great. Thank you, William. And thank you, Jenny and Lynn, for your um, great web, um, presentations today. And thank you, William and Victor, for the opportunity and for the, um, the audience for your participation. Really appreciate the opportunity. Yes, nothing to add. <laughs> Excellent. Great. So you can already register for our next webinars.
On the 23rd of August, we'll be having a webinar on the challenges of developing antibiotic combinations. So this will be um, with Michael N. Dudley and Glendale speaking and Carl A. Sabre as um, moderator. So if you're unable to attend this webinar, please do still register so you can still um, have access to the recording. So that will be all from our side. Thank you everyone for joining today and contributing to this discussion. I hope you found the webinar interesting and useful and that you'll join again in the future. Please do spread the word and encourage your colleagues to join as well. Thanks and goodbye. Bye-bye.